so to tell you where I'm headed this morning, my aim is to make this the last lesson on the fifth commandment um, because we desire to make them one a week and we extend them where we think it's wise and we're able, uh, but I don't want to extend it any longer considering that, that desire. But having said that, there will be parts that I'm going to leave out. I'll explain to you or tell you what those parts are and give you a good reference for further study in those areas. Okay, so let's do a review. Last time we looked at which is the fifth commandment. So let's read that. If you want, you can turn to Exodus chapter 20. And it's verse 12. Honor your father and your mother that you may that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. So last week I just tried to go into exp- expositing the fifth commandment and focused primarily on the scope. The scope was Narrowly, the commandment focuses on your parental authority. Your natural parental authority. But broadly, the commandment addresses and within its scope includes all authority belonging to everyone in several places and relations as superiors, inferiors, or equals. And we looked at how the Bible uses... The word, the terms father and mother in different contexts with reference to different relationships and not only the parent child relationship. Some of the, the word father and mother that we saw was we saw the word father or mother used with reference to rulers, to military chiefs, prophets, wisdom teachers, those with peculiar giftings church leaders and officers, and just the aged, older people. And then ultimately, the Bible uses the word Father with reference to God, the first person of the Trinity. And all authority uh, that exists, exists up under Him. So He is the one in whom we get a proper definition of what it means to be a father. And everywhere in the Bible we see the word father or mother. We are to begin with God and and consider how He rules and reigns and uses His authority. And then from that reference, consider how that father in that peculiar relationship is to serve and how we are to treat them. So to give to remind you of what superiors are, inferiors and equals. Superiors are your parents and kind of like I already said, church officers, civil officers, employers, masters, older people. Inferiors are our children or children, church members. They're inferior in authority to elders. And when a deacon is um, ministering in his office, those whom he's ministering to and seeking to get aid from, they're inferior to him and his authority. Citizens, so we're citizens of heaven, but we're also citizens of America, and we're subject to the governing authorities. Employees, slaves, servants, younger people, and then there's also uh, equals. And an equal is anyone made in the image of God. So if there's no peculiar authority relationship that you have with someone, whether you're inferior to them or they're superior to you, it doesn't matter in the sense that the commandment still applies. Now its scope reaches to treating them as your equal made in the image of God. So, I want to go to a verse and give you warrant for why that scope is broad and why there's this connection between 
the use of the word father and mother in the Bible in reference to these other relationships and how we can look at them as fathers and mothers, so to speak, and know with biblical conviction that those particular functions that God has put over us as authorities um, are governed by the fifth commandment. I want to make that connection. It's not just that we ought to obey our rulers because the Bible says it in Romans 13. That's true. We ought to obey our rulers because the fifth commandment obligates us. I want you all to see that connection beyond just me making a connection saying by way of analogy. So if you look to, at Malachi 1.6, Okay, this is uh, the Lord, a the fa- uh, God the Father. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you. So, what is the Lord doing there? He's not going to the first commandment to expose the guilt of the Jews. He's going to the fifth commandment. In other words, the fifth commandment applies to honoring God the Father. I didn't make that connection. The Lord made that. So, for those of us among us today who are having a hang-up, with seeing this commandment broad in its scope, I would say consider at the very least your hermeneutics. You might have a strict literal interpretation of the Bible that will limit your understanding of Scripture in many ways. Um, Or consider in your heart whether or not you're stubborn and do not want this commandment to apply to other areas. In other words, God is saying, the commandment, honor your father and your mother, your parental authorities. If that commandment applies to your parental authority father, and if I am a father, why does that commandment not apply to me? And you could use that for ruler. If God would use the term father for a ruler, and if you know you ought to honor your parental parents according to the fifth commandment, why would you not apply that to your ruler who God has said it metaphorically is like a father? It, it's kind of like Deborah could say something similar. You know, if if uh, you know to honor your mother, and I am a mother in Israel, where is my honor? Or um, you could you could apply that to, to to the other roles. I just I, I thought that was helpful to see that the Lord Himself interpreting His Scripture for us, showing that this this commandment is broad in its scope and it reaches not just to our parental authorities, but it reaches up to heaven and how we ought to submit to God according to the fifth commandment. And by way of uh, using that same hermeneutic with reference to all these other areas that the Bible uses father and mother, we know that the commandment applies to those areas as well. It's not just that it's commanded and we're looking for a very specific commandment to honor a master if I happen to be a slave. I can go to the fifth commandment and know that I'm supposed to honor this master. I thought I think that's helpful because uh, in my own heart and in 
ministering with others, I know there's this disposition to want to limit the commandments of God in ways that are unbiblical. We want to say it doesn't apply to the heart. We want to say it doesn't reach out into scope. It's categorically over here. But no, it's not. So, hope that helps. And then, where we left off last week was the word honor. And I wanted to pick right back up there. And this word gets used in a lot of different ways. Uh, The literal meaning is to be heavy or weigh much or to make heavy or feel heavy. So if you look at Job 6.3 For then it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore my words have been rash. I just wanted you to see that that same word, honor, is here used as heavier. So, <clears throat> in some contexts, it implies a raising or changing of financial status. Uh, it can be, it can mean being distinguished or honored or renowned. Be in a state of high status among a group of any size. And in our context, it means to honor. To not literally, but figuratively, take the relationships that you have, whether inferior to superior or superior to inferior or equal, and count that particular relationship as weighty. Not as... Um, light. Uh, the things that we consider weighty, we we allow ourselves to have let that have influence over us. Just like gravity pulls a big weight to the ground and it influences my arms and legs, uh, whereas a feather doesn't have any influence over what I do. The the relationship of different authorities and different inferiors and equals ought to have a weight to them. Uh, They ought to be weighty or be heavy to us, not light. And like I read last time, the NET says, the commandment calls for people to give their parents the respect and honor that is appropriate for them. It could be paraphrased to say, give them the weight of authority that they deserve. Next, to God, parents are to be highly valued, cared for, and respected. And if I had to make it really short, I'd say it means to respect, revere, love, and obey. And I want to use that word revere carefully. Respect, revere, love, and obey. Are there, before we go into what is required in the fifth commandment, are there any questions from last week or now? Um, hi. Um, Hello. I wanted to ask, since you're saying that um, in Exodus 20, since you're going over the fifth commandment, you're saying that, just to clarify that, since you're saying it's in a general scope, so you're saying that we're supposed to respect everyone? Because if I go to Ephesians 6, verse 1, mm-hmm. it says, Children, obey your parents. And then it goes on to say that this is the first commandment with the promise. So I don't think that they're saying in general, like obey the police officers or whatever you're saying. I think that the fifth commandment is strictly dealing with that because there's more verses that just deal with honoring your elders. I don't think that the fifth commandment is dealing with authorities yeah. or things like that. Yeah, I understand. Uh, so to answer that question, I think it would be helpful to review how the Bible uses the word father and mother. Mm-hmm. It doesn't just use that word with reference to our biological parents. So, uh, And la- uh, last week, 
uh, we focused on that almost exclusively. So I, I think that if you were to, uh, were you were you able to hear the last week's mm-hmm. lesson? Okay. Yeah, uh, that's um, a very good starting point for understanding the scope of this commandment. Is why would God use the word Father for a ruler? Why would He do that? And then why would He say you need to honor your parents? And if you honor your parents, where's my honor since I'm a father? That's because he's making an analogy by the word father. They are a father and I am a father. And according to the fifth commandment, not only should you honor them, but you should honor me. Um, and also the commandments uh, are not exhaustive in the, rev- in the form they come in. Uh, we need all of Scripture to properly interpret them. So, for example, uh, Jesus, what, I'll talk about now another relationship. What if someone were to argue that adultery is something that we just do physically? That the commandment, the word adultery literally means to be wed and to cheat on your spouse uh, through fornication. Does that mean the commandment is limited to a husband and a wife and forbids fornication outside of that wedlock? And Jesus comes out very clearly in Matthew 5 and He shows how the commandment doesn't just apply to the external behavior. It applies to the heart. For you to um, receive that means you have to now reinterpret the fifth commandment if you didn't have that, com- or not fifth, the seventh. If you didn't have the seventh commandment interpreted spiritually before, now you would have to have it because Jesus made that clear. And then Jesus also made it clear that that commandment wasn't being taught new, it was always meant that. Um, so not with reference to external to internal, but with reference from one relationship type to another. Uh, the reason why we make that jump is because the Bible does. The Bible does it by analogy, and there are many things that the Bible um, includes through principle by way of analogy. Does anybody want to add anything to that? Yeah, I- I wanted something that was very helpful when I was studying the Ten Commandments for the the second and the fourth commandment is to understand that when the when we have the Ten Commandments, the way that God gives those Ten Commandments are by way of synecdoche. So um, when He gives us the first commandment, the second commandment, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and all the way down to the tenth, He He gives a specific command like honor your father and mother, which is really just a part that represents the whole. So that's what a synecdoche is. It's to use the part for the whole. Like if I, it's a figure of speech. If I said, hey, come outside guys and check out my new wheels, I'm using the part of the car, the wheels, to represent the whole of the car. Really what I'm saying is come and check out my new car. I'm not just saying come and check out my wheels. So that's the way that God, that's the figure of speech that God is using in the Ten Commandments. When He says, honor your father and mother, He's using the part. There's no doubt about it that He is saying, honor your biological father and mother. But He's using that part to speak of all who hold a position of authority. So in Ephesians 6.1, He is specifically saying, Children, obey your parents. He's, he's specifically saying, obey your parents. And that's what he means. Children, he's speaking to children, and he's saying, obey your parents, for this is right. But then he appeals to the Ten Commandments. He appeals to the, the Fifth Commandment, you shall honor your father and mother. So um, I don't think Ryan is saying in Ephesians 6.1, children, obey your parents, that that is a synecdoche. No. 
he's not. He's saying that the commandment, the fifth commandment, is a synecdoche. So that not only is God saying, honor your father and mother, you're biological, but um, he, he uses that part to speak of honoring everybody who is in a position of authority. And that's why you would say that what he's commanding in the fifth commandment is honoring those who hold an office in the church, who hold an office in government, who um, are, are in any place of, of authority. You know? So it's very helpful when understanding the commandments. And even really like sin, like sin lists in the Bible. You know, like um, there's going to be one in the call to repentance today in Malachi chapter 3, verses 5 to 7, where he label, he points his finger at sorcery, those who swear falsely, and who oppress the, the widow. But he's not just saying that these are the only narrow commandments that these people have committed. They're kind of representative parts to speak of all sins of like manner. Thank you. So I, I think that if you're still concerned or want to ask more, we could look at it maybe after after the class. But let's move on. So that's what honor uh, means, and it's looking at the Word and um, applying it in context, finding the right meaning. Give those in authority or inferiors, or equals, the weight of authority that they deserve. Okay, so what is required in the fifth commandment? And the answer in our catechism is the fifth commandment requires the preserving the honor and performing the duties belonging to everyone in their several places and relations as superiors, inferiors, or equals. So this morning, I'm going to start with superiors and probably uh, almost exclusively focus on them because of the, the depth I want to go with superiors. The commandment is addressed to the inferior and how they ought to relate to the superiors. And that's why I'm going to focus the class today on that. How we ought to relate to superiors. Do you have a question? Um, just a quick one, brother. I was you just read um, Job um, chapter six, verse three. I didn't make that connection. What we were trying to oh yeah say there. I'm I was sorry. just showing this this uh, Hebrew word used in another context. So literally, the word can mean make heavy or be heavy. And that's the way Job used it in that text. I just wanted you to show you how that, that word, that Hebrew word, uh, can mean, and, and Job was translated heavy, um, because that's the literal meaning. But it, uh, just like in our language, we have literal meanings to words, and we have um, figurative meanings, like we have a, the word hand. I, have a, I could use the word hand, and I mean literally a hand, or I can say, give me a hand, and I mean, give me help. Um, so what I'm showing you is that Job used the word in its literal sense to let you get an understanding of the nature of that word. Uh, in language, normally, the, the, the way a word develops in meaning, it starts with a literal and works to the metaphorical. So when you understand the literal meaning of a word, often it helps your understanding of the metaphorical usage. So, okay, yeah, the the word for honor. So it doesn't. If we were to translate it literally, we would say heavy your mother and father, uh, which we translator knows that's not what the the intent is, so they go to the metaphorical meaning, but now we understand though what that means better when it says honor, and that's why I read this. Give them the heaviness of the authority that they deserve. Give them the weight of the authority that they deserve. Honor. Okay. Let's go to superiors. 
And that's why I've got superiors all up here. I don't mind giving you a, a quick uh, answer to inferiors and equals. And we've kind of already hit on it before. Uh, but I would like to continue moving through after superiors to get on to the reason. So, what is required in the fifth commandment? Well, first, I think this is a good... Uh, here are some of the primary requirements of the commandment or what the commandment involves with how to honor and in what way. So turn with me to Matthew 15. One through eight. Our our uh, obedience to the fifth commandment, like with all the commandments, must begin in the heart. God in no way desires any of us to be formalists. Yes, we are not to throw off the form because we see disobedience in the heart. But God's commandment goes to the heart always. And in 15, 1-8, you can see that with reference to this commandment. Then uh, Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells his father or mother, What, would you, have what you would have gained from me is given to God. He need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And I'll stop there for sticking on to the point. With reference to our parents, with reference to our church leaders, with reference to... And I, I, I could do this every time. Just go through the whole, the whole scope. You, I need you to do that for time's sake. Just, just continue to think. Get your heart and your mind thinking beyond your parents. Thinking about your employer. Thinking about your employees. Thinking about your church. Your leaders. Thinking about leaders. Think about them as members. How you relate to them. Think about uh, children. How you relate to your parents. Of course. But parents, how do you relate to your children? Think about how you relate to others as equals. How do you honor others as equals who are made in the image of God? Remember, James said... You speak well of God, and you bless God, but then you curse your neighbor um, who's made in the similitude of God or the likeness of God. So continue to think that way. Um, and now go to the heart. What is your heart disposition to your parents? See here, do you all understand what the Pharisees and scribes did? They came up with a tradition, a, a rule of men, and they said, well, if I have the, uh, a very nice gift, uh, if I dedicate that to God, um, and this, this money, let's say it's money, would actually help my family and need my parents, because I'm going to give this to God, I'm not obligated to give it to my parents to help them in need. So Jesus said, he need not honor his father by your tradition. You don't even, Jesus is saying, okay, when you do that, you don't even need to obey the commandment. Now you've got a, a nice, neat way to disobey. And then he says, hypocrites. And the reason why is they're putting on this pious work of, look at this gift I'm giving to God. And they wear a mask saying, look how righteous I am. But Jesus says, I want to take that mask off and say underneath this is evil, wickedness. Because that gift should have been given to your parents in honoring of them. So, now, 
what would cause us to do that? In our hearts. In their hearts. The Pharisees and scribes, in their hearts, they did not honor their parents. The disposition of their heart towards their parents was one of dishonor. They looked at the authority and the relation that they had to their parents, knowing it was from God, and disregarded it, counted it a very light thing, and said, it's okay to come up with a tradition because your authority over me is means nothing. And that's sin. So th- think about what is your disposition of your heart to your parents, your church leaders, your civil officers, your employer, older people within the church, teachers. When you think of your parents, what weight do they have in your heart as your parents? When you think of your church leaders, what weight do they have in your heart as your pastor or deacon? When you think of local law enforcement, local civil leaders, and the President of the United States, what weight do they have in your heart as leaders? Remember that they have been placed there by God. It's not chance. It's not self-will. It's not man-made. They are put there by God. And God commands you to honor them from the heart. So let me ask ask the, everybody here: uh, What are some what are reasons that we find? I'm not saying they're valid, but what are reasons that we find to dishonor others in their various relationship to us as superiors and inferiors or equals? And you could start with the parents and, and move to employers and church leaders. But as you're thinking about that. What are reasons that we, we use? Here, they use piety. They use the name of God. I'm giving a gift to God, and that's the reason they found to dishonor their, God, uh, dishonor their parents. But what are some common reasons for us? I think you touched on this um, last week, but when someone's uh, character isn't deserving of honor, we perceive and we neglect the office. Yep, yep, that's a really common one. Um, We may say like the busyness of life, like especially with our parents, like if, you know, we all live our lives separate and so we can say, well, we're too busy to help care or visit or um, respect them in any way. Yeah. We, we don't give them the weight. We say, we make excuses. Barbie? Or, uh, why, you got the, I'm sorry, Linda? If we disagree with what they're doing... Okay, yeah, that's a lot with what Rebecca was saying. So we disagree with them in character or practice. It goes back to the very essence of sin on Genesis 3 for the fall. Um, Essentially just self, um, not submitting. Yeah, it is. It is self. Um, I just wanted us to, to bring that out and consider how we come up with all these reasons to live and dishonoring of others. And they're not valid. It doesn't matter. If you think about um, Romans 13, when Paul commands them to... um, What was the words that he uses? Let me just read that real briefly. Be subject. Thank you. Be subject to rulers. Think about the Caesars of that time. They were very vile men, persecuting Christians. And then here is an agent of God saying, be subject to them. So their character or their practice, both, um, are, are, is not a valid reason for you to have a heart that dishonors them according to their role. I'm not saying that you can't recognize the fruit of that tree and um, know that that person is evil. 
and that they very well may command you in their authority to do evil things, and that you are not, God would command you not to submit to that. But that person or people, regardless of their character or practices, and doesn't strip them of the authority that God has given them over you. And because God has put them in that position of authority, you are to honor them. And I think about how the Lord did that. You know, He said to the Pharisees, um, not the Pharisees, His disciples about the Pharisees, He said, listen. Listen to them, but don't do what they say. Or not do what they say. Don't do what they do. He is obeying the fifth commandment and teaching others to do the same. He listened to them. He sat down and said, God put, he, I can see right through your whitewashed tomb. And I'm going to listen to what you have to say because you are in this place by God's authority. And I want to hear what God has for you to say to me that is true. I'm going to give weight to your place, but I'm not going to do like you do because you don't obey what you say. Um, so when it comes to like different things in regards to someone in authority who maybe keeps the law, like a police officer, governor, etc., who then makes desires you to do something unlawful, right? right? Like how would you keep that dynamic of respecting their authority and also? I am not going to do the unlawful thing. Yeah, uh, so you're able to keep that dynamic by, by submitting to God. So God is supreme in authority. And our, our submission to the authorities of others is in, in doing so, we are simultaneously submitting to the Father. We submit to others Precisely because we submit to God. When we submit to, when I honor my mother from the heart, by the Spirit, in faith, I'm doing that because in faith I'm honoring God. I'm submitting to God. So uh, if you keep that dynamic, you start with God and go down. As they disobey God and seek to cause you to disobey God, it's, they're clearly operating outside of the responsibilities in their God-given position that they were assigned to. And now, I have an, a choice based on their sin. Do I obey them or I obey God? Well, God is supreme in priority. So I love and obey Him. I'm loyal to Him. And I will now disobey you in what you're seeking to have me do. But I'm going to still relate to you in that position and treat you with respect. Or I'm going to respectfully disobey. And like kind of maybe just for clarification, because there are different ways that we can do like within our society, if we have a disagreement with the law, that something was unlawful to go through different channels, like with judges, etc. But I know there are certain people who are of the opinion to confront it right then and there. So if you have someone who's street preaching, and it is legal for them to street preach mm -hmm. in that area, and the cops say, "Sorry, you got to go." Mm -hmm. But what they are doing is unlawful by asking the person to leave, mm -hmm. right? So when it comes to our submission to authority, that's what kind of what I mean. Like, is it is it um, being disobedient and disrespectful to that authority member by like taking a stand there? and not going through those means, or I don't know. Right. I think your key word there is there. And the question is where. You know, What dynamics help me understand where to do that and when to do it? And we got to go back to the Scripture. So, it's, and there are going to be issues that aren't easy. Like when we get into like just war. And it's like that with... Uh, other commandments too. We can get into difficult questions that take wisdom to know how to apply the commandment. And I don't have a, a, a nice, neat principle that is an infallible guide 
from my own knowledge of the word, I, I, you know, we need all of Scripture, and even apart from Scripture, I'm I'm helpless, or, or even with Scripture, I'm helpless. I need the Spirit of God to open my eyes and give me understanding with it to know how to make decisions with reference to the fifth commandment. But if your heart, you know, if you start here with your heart, that's already the appropriate place to begin. Is I'm going to relate to this person or these persons with a heart seeking to honor the Lord first and honor you in the authority that you have. And then as I labor to decide whether or not I'm is appropriate for me to not obey your commandment, I'm going to consider the Scripture, beseech the Lord, and Lord willing, uh, by God's grace, make a wise decision. If you have time, you get counsel. You know, but that's not an easy question when you get into hairy ones. Or what I mean by hairy is uh, ones that aren't as clear. And you find orthodox, solid Christians falling on different sides when you start to see that, you start to see you're in an area that's not easily to, easy to discern. Um, but the difficulty of discerning those hard cases is uh, a rarity. We don't have a problem knowing what it means to honor our parents. You know, we there's a, there's a, even with the, the the second part of this commandment, the reason annexed to it, that so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. That's not absolute. It's a norm, but there are exceptions to it in, in, in the sense that sometimes righteous people die early. Or they have a life, you know, so we have to go into that. And I want to do that. But um, with reference to when there, is it there that I disobey? Is it there? Well, we can see in Scripture the Hebrew wives disobey when they were told to murder their children. We can see in Scripture that Peter and John, I believe it was, disobeyed the Sanhedrin when they were commanded not to preach in the name of Christ. Those are clear. They're descriptive, but they're also uh, uh, examples of what is good. Uh, and then we work from those examples. We work from the principles. And with God's grace, we apply it well. Let's move to the next one. Honor superiors in word. And and by the way, like uh, I heard one one more, one more comment about the heart. Um, some of the reasons why we disobey in truth dishonor is because of our pride. We are high minded, and we don't need the Lord. We don't submit to the Lord. Therefore, we don't need His authorities and we don't submit to His authorities. We have selfish... That's another one. Selfish ambition. So sometimes pride runs off into selfish ambition. I want what I want. I'm, I'm, I want to pave the way and I want what I want. And I'm going to do whatever I can to acquire it. And now when an authority comes in with wisdom and says you can't do that or that's unwise or uh, be patient, wait, don't do that. You just put, press just plow right on by out of selfish ambition. Another one's unbelief. When you don't trust the Lord, when you don't depend upon Him and trust Him and you go through things in life like a sinning authority figure, you're not going to labor to see them as God tells you to see them. You're not going to honor them as they ought to be honored according to their position. And then another one I, I heard and, and then thought about was discontentment. You know, uh, some people think about a, an employee. Man, my boss told me that I would in time get a, a raise, and now I haven't got it when I thought I'd get it, and I want more money. I got bills to pay, and I got things I want to spend it on, and I'm not getting money. And you go to work, and you go to work. You're just discontent. Discontent. Now, you, they, this becomes the reason why you disobey. Or a wife. Uh, she doesn't like the particular lifestyle. She doesn't like that she doesn't get to see somebody as frequent as she wants. 
She doesn't get what she wants in this area. So her discontentment grows, and now her relation to her husband is one of rebellion. A dishonoring him, you know. So those are some real reasons. Not that you didn't give real reasons, but the reasons that we make up, they're often self-justified. So let's go to honor them in word. The first text, you don't have to go there, just, just listen and I'll go to a different one for time. Proverbs 31, 28 talks about the, the, uh, the proverbial wise woman. And her husband and her children rise up and bless her. So how do they relate to their mother? How do they relate to how does he relate to his wife? He uses his words. He blesses her. Now I want to show you. Go to Genesis 18. This is uh, before Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. Uh, the Lord appeared to Abraham. And he comes to Abraham, and Abraham and Sarah make a meal for him, and then he has a he intercedes for Sodom. Well, in the midst of that, if you'll remember, uh, the Lord made a promise. So, if you'll go to verse nine, they said to him, "Where is Sarah, your wife?" And she said. And he said, she is in the tent. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? So she doubted the Lord. That sin. Then, keep reading to 15. The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, No, but you did laugh. In the midst of this encounter, she uses the word Lord to reference Abraham. What appears on the text, front and center, is her sin. But if you go over to 1 Peter, the Holy Spirit picks up her usage of the word Lord with reference to Abraham. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. Did y'all see where she said, My Lord, there? First Peter chapter three, verse five and six. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You can see it's the grace of God there. And positively God showing us and commanding us through Peter. This is how we ought to relate to others and the way we speak to them, the way we speak about them. It doesn't mean literally that you need to start calling your husband Lord, uh, but what words do we use of others? You know, what words do children use of their parents? What words do husbands use of their wives? And what words do wives use of their husbands? And what words do you employees use of your employers? I know those relationships are different and they come with different dynamics, but um, we ought to be honoring others in our various relationships. And particularly with husbands and wives, they need to, uh, and children and parents, they need to consider the words they use to them and the words they use about them. Um, that, that, 
is not a man-made thing. How we speak about other with respect is not from men. I know there are Lord-bearing people out there that just want a whole bunch of praise and respect all the time and just be venerated as if they were a deity. Um, and to some lesser extent, that even occurs in our own homes. But that doesn't mean that we ought not to use our mouth in such a way that honors those in whom we relate to. So husbands, the way you honor your wife and the way you speak about her, consider that. And wives, the way that you honor your husband and the way you speak to him, the way you address him. She wasn't actually speaking to Abraham that day. She was just speaking about him. Shall me and my Lord. So she had just this pattern of speaking of him with this kind of term of respect. And that's picked up by the Holy Spirit in 1 Peter 3 as an example of how we ought to imitate. Okay, let's go to... Um, I could go to 1 Timothy and how they respect older men. Um, but let's go to honor them in behavior. And 1 Kings chapter 2. So what's happening here is David's about to die. Uh, in chapter one, he gets cold at night, and they brought they bring a young, beautiful woman, Abishag the Shunammite, and the young woman was very beautiful, and she attended to King David. In chapter one, David's dying, and he has appointed Solomon as his heir, right? Well, as David gets to his deathbed, Adonijah seeks to usurp Solomon's title to the throne uh, by taking it. So if you look at verse 5, now Adonijah in chapter 1, the son of Haggith exalted himself saying, I will be king. Okay, And he starts to take uh, motions to do that. Well, it's found out and then Nathan and Bathsheba come to David and they say, look at what Adonijah's doing. He's trying to steal the throne from Solomon. Didn't you say? Um, in verse 17, she said to him, My Lord, you swore to your servant by the Lord your God, saying, Solomon, your son shall reign after me and he shall sit on my throne. So Adonijah's trying to usurp the throne. David takes corrective action immediately in a, an appropriate way um, and thrones Solomon in his place. Now, then, then comes, what are we going to do with Adonijah who was just rebelling? Well, Solomon shows him mercy. and basically says, if, if his heart's right within him, then he will be, I will not touch him. But if he turns out to be wicked, he will die. And that's exactly what Adonijah does. Adonijah, later on, some time goes by, and he says, I'll concoct a plan to get jockey into position and perhaps even get back the throne. Or not that he had it. And the way I'm going to do it is I can't get permission to marry Abishag, David's attendant. David's dead now, but David had an attendant, Abishag. I want to marry her. That will give me uh, some weight within the royal circle. And I'm going to use that to get back at getting the throne. Right? He knows he can't marry her without Solomon's approval, but he doesn't go directly to Solomon. He goes to Bathsheba. Solomon's mother. It's not his mother, it's Solomon's mother. And if you look in chapter, nine, chapter 2, verse 19, Ab Adonijah said to Bathsheba, tell Solomon I want Abishag. So Bathsheba went to, the, to King Solomon to speak to him on behalf of Adonijah, and the king rose to meet her and bowed to her. That's, that's really where I'm headed. Then he sat on his throne and he had a seat brought before his king's mother and she sat on his right. Then she said, I have one small request to make of you. Do not refuse me. And the king said to her, Make your request, my mother, for I will not refuse you. She said, Let Abishag the Shunammite be given to Adonijah your brother as wife. King Solomon answered his mother, And why do you ask Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? Ask for him the kingdom also, for he is my older brother. And on his side are Abiathar 
the priest, and Joab, the son of Zariah. So David, or, uh, Solomon sees right through it, and Adonijah doesn't live after that. But, how did he behave with reference to his mom? He's the king. He's sitting on his throne, and here comes his mom approaching. What does he do? The king rose up. Here comes his mother. He rises up off the throne. He honors her. And then he bows down to her. Then he sat on his throne and he didn't just have a seat. He didn't have her stand. He said, get another throne and have it seated right next to me. Uh, so in doing that, you can see the, the behavior that the commandment requires us to have to starting with our parents. And we ought to have a, a heart disposition of honoring those in our various relationships that would lead to behavior that honors them, not just speech. That's why in Leviticus 19.32, God said in the Old Covenant, which I believe uh, in principle you can... You get you get it right over here in the New Testament, not not in, in the exact form, but in principle you can see it. He says, "Recognize the presence of the aged and stand up in their presence." Does anybody have any questions right now, or anything they'd like to add before we close? And not only are we to honor them in our behavior, but in 1 Timothy, we are to be praying and giving thanks for them and to care for your superiors as you're able and as is appropriate for the relationship that you have with them. If you remember Jesus on the cross, He cared for His mother by giving Him her John and John her. Uh, and in Proverbs it says, do not despise your mother when she is old. Uh, Thomas Watson said, such children are monsters, shall I say, are to blame who are, who are ashamed of their parents when they are old and fallen into decay. When they ask for bread, give them a stone. When houses are shut up, we say the plague is there. When children's hearts are shut up against their parents, the plague is there. Um... I think uh, I told you I'd give you a reference for inferiors equals and what is forbidden. I would start. I think a good place to start is the Westminster. It it gives a a good descriptive definition of what it means to obey in these inferiors and uh, equals, and also what is forbidden in these commandments. And you could start in Westminster question larger catechism question one twenty eight and go down. I'll leave it there. Uh, a question. I was just seeing, um, like, looking at the vastness of this command and just in my own heart how there's, like, an inability, like, I can sense myself to obey it fully. So I was just wondering if you had any practical ways of, uh, like, putting off disobedience and dishonoring and putting on. Yeah. Um, I would... Re and taking that in general, uh, return back to the ordinary means of grace. So, uh, there's no effective way to grow in the Christian life apart from God's uh, appointed means of grace. So, um, prayer, uh, continuing to meditate upon, read and study the Word of God, uh, continue to get counsel, and be humble to be admonished and taught. Um, and uh, seek the Lord. You know, ask Him for grace, to for wisdom, and like I heard somebody say recently, for holiness. Uh, and there's other means of grace, like the ordinances. You know, and I could broaden that to say practical obedience in other areas actually not in and of itself is has virtue, but by God's working through those means of grace, bleeds over into other areas. So uh, there's a not easily described relationship between obedience and other areas. 
and others, like evangelism, you know, or small group, or uh, worshiping God in song and in hymns. Those uh, participation and those means of grace by faith um, will have a, an, an effect in other areas like the fifth commandment. Um, but you've got a Bible study on this already and you got introduced to some, some new ways of thinking about it and some resources too. You've been introduced to some text so we can meditate upon that and begin to implement it. I'll, I'll leave it there. Let's, let's close. Gracious Father in heaven, we praise You for Jesus Christ who is our righteousness. Oh, we stand back as Peter when he received the fish and we said, depart from me for I am a sinner. Uh, Lord, we have not kept this commandment more ways than we can count. Are we disobedient? And we dishonor so many. Um, we praise You for Your mercy in Christ. Thank You for satisfying Your justice in Him. For punishing Him, Lord, for our sins. We praise You, Lord Jesus, and worship Your holy name. Truly, You are God and man. You are righteous and holy. Uh, help us by the Spirit to keep these commandments, to keep this commandment, and begin in our lives to be salt and life by showing to a perverse, rebellious, dishonoring generation that uh, the living God it dwells within us by keeping this commandment, uh, not perfectly, um, but aiming for perfection by faith. In Christ's name, Amen.